territories, the Hokalminam and Sankotan people in my particular region, and uh, where I am immensely grateful to be living and working um, in this really bountiful and wonderful environment. Um, tonight, I'm, uh, I think Erica summarized the uh, uh, talk content pretty concisely. I'm hoping to take about an hour to talk to you about, uh, about this subject, and then we definitely want to hear questions from you. And um, so let's get started. Well, that's no surprise. The climate emergency is here. Um, you know, we no one can be missing this now. Um, this was a couple of years ago when California smoke uh, smoked us all out up here. Uh, Canadian smoke has just certainly did a good job of smoking out the eastern seaboard of Canada of uh, the U.S. this year. Um, it's not just fires, of course, but the the weather extremes are having really serious impacts on ecosystems and our landscapes and our human and animal health, um, agricultural productivity, the economy, it's all really beginning to um, experience and, and, and feel the effects. So I'm not going to address all of that. I'm going to talk really right now just about the challenges for gardeners and growers. So, and it, it boils down to the weather, the really increasingly variable weather under as the climate has been changing. So yes, higher average temperatures um, and extended periods of extreme high and low temperatures. Higher averages has not meant that we have missed the low temperatures. The low temperatures are, are with us for sure. Um, drier summers, periods of heavier rainfall, basically wherever you live, um, there is projected to be, and in fact, we are seeing changes in the way precipitation is distributed through the year. In the particular ecosystem that I live in the coastal part of British Columbia, it's, it's just like the coastal part of Washington state. Um, it's dry in the summer and our, it's just drier now than it was. And we're getting about the same amount of rain in the winter, but it's coming in heavy, heavy storms um, more rain, uh, more precipitation over shorter periods of time. Uh, we're seeing increased storm intensity, certainly globally and higher winds. But, but basically the rapidly changing unprecedented conditions <clears throat> means that we really have to adapt to and rethink everything we're doing as growers. Um, it's, it, it's affecting everything. So I will give you some examples of that as we go. And just to remember that we've just hit the hottest year ever. The global average temperatures reached a new high in July this year. The oceans have never been hotter. The, in fact, the whole month of July was the hottest month globally in 120,000 years. That's since the last ice age. And of the, it's, it's actually since the time that humans have been um, um, operating on the planet. And there's, well, there's not much to be said about that, except I'm going to show you from my region with the historical averages compared to what the projections are for in another uh, 20 to 30, 20 to 40 years. Just showing you the changes on a very local, this is Vancouver Island. So if you know, uh, this is um, Bellingham right here in Washington, but Victoria would be here. And I'm actually on a little island right here, just off of Vancouver Island. So a lot of projected um, changes, increasing average temperatures, but that is not the whole story. Um, someone I know that uh, has worked for, that used to, is a statistician for our um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. He's now retired, but he took the last 30 or 40 years of data weather records for our very local region, Vancouver Island, and Qualicum Beach, which is a location just north of Victoria on Vancouver Island, and plotted the winter minimums. Our, our, our winters are definitely warmer on average, but our winter minimums have been decreasing. So, so what that shows us is that we're getting even greater extremes. What has also happened in practice is, is that we're seeing more cold injury and actually killing of plants that are a bit marginal, they would be West Coast plants. These are not plants that you're going to be growing in the Cascades or on the other side of the, the mountains, but 
bay laurel and uh, rhododendrons, a severe rhod uh, cold injury on rhododendrons here. Um, the mahonias, madrone, um, escalonia, um, things that aren't that hard. Well, they're, they're woody plants that are hardy enough for this zone are being either killed or badly injured. So it is weather extremes and not the averages that are determining what we can grow. Um, the frequent, frequent extreme weather in my region alone, just in six months, uh, two years ago, we hit a record for everything, heat, drought, rainfall, and winter cold. And we didn't just hit records, we blew them out of the water. Uh, four or five uh, degrees higher average temperatures in the interior in the, in the Canadian Okanagan and that was when the, the entire city uh, of, um, I just went blank. Um, anyway, we've got very, very bad forest fires that have swept through and just e eradicated um, whole towns. Um, that following summer, we had, uh, or, well, actually, it was the same heat dome in 2021. It was a buildup of heat. Uh, that just locked into place because the, the the jet stream is slowing down and and things are events cold uh, lows and high pressure systems are staying in um in place they're taking longer to move in that sort of west to east weather pattern that we're used to and in this case the one that happened at the end of june in 2021 which was considered a once in a thousand year event um the weather attribution um, project, which is a, a group of scientists that are trying to determine um, what poor part of a climate extreme or weather, sorry, weather extreme could be related to climate change. So they're trying to attribute, because we all have variable weather. We all know the weather does vary. Um, they figured that that should have been 150 times more likely under climate change, the heat dome, meaning it would be something like a once in a five to 10 year event in the future instead of a once in a thousand year event. Now these were extreme temperatures. We were well over 100, 110, 115 degrees in places that have never had anything like that temperature before. And so you think, well, every five to 10 years this could happen, except that all, not even 18 months later, it was only 16 months later in October, we had the exact same pattern in 2022. And had it occurred a couple months earlier in the year, we would have been just as hot according to the meteorologists. So we definitely have the extremes to deal with. And so how does that affect plants? Well, it does disrupt the seasonal adaptations of plants. Plants are uh, adapted to uh, the summers and then the timing of spring and really cold weather in the winter. They, they, be, they become very uh, resilient to cold if they have time to do their normal physiological processes to get ready for cold. But the, the effect of a really warm early spring is that buds break earlier in the spring, but with the cold or risk of frost remains the same. The frost is still, we're still getting late frosts. So the earlier fruit tree buds break, for example, the more likely it is that there will be damage to the crop because you're still getting the late the, the later uh, frosts in the spring. On the other end of the season, if cold uh, winter cold arrives early, then and plants haven't gone through what's really a hardening off process. There's a whole physiological process of adaptation to cold, but if it's prematurely um, stopped by a super early cold spell, then in this case, you see leaves that were just frozen on the tree and stayed there the entire winter. In 2022, that, that's the, the heat dome in October that year, was an unusually warm fall. And um, the hardening off was really delayed. Here's an apple tree. This is a November 16th picture with an apple tree that has just shot up all new growth. And yet some plants are in fact go starting to drop their leaves. It was very um, inconsistent. There was a huge variation in how the different uh, deciduous species responded to that hot fall. And yet this year we've had an unusually cold October and it's snowed at my house this last month, which it has never snowed here before in October. So there you go. But what are these effects? Well, it, you know, as gardeners, you know plants don't grow when it's cold. 
a photosynthesis of uh, the plants that we typically grow in this region, photosynthesis stops below about 40 degrees. It just, you know, it's just too cold for plants to, cells to uh, undertake that process. And of course, if it gets too cold, we know that things can be damaged by frost, depending on what kind of plant it is. But you may not realize that really hot days are lost growing days too. Growth slows as temperatures get higher and higher and photosynthesis has an upper limit. It stops above 77 to 95, it depends on the plant. The cabbage family plants, they're not really very happy above 70, 75, 77 degrees. So, um, and then if it gets really hot, then leaf cells and fruit cells can be killed. Uh, there's interruptions in the physiology of how plants even work at those temperatures, which leads to plant stress, stress and growth disorders. And I'll be showing you some of these. And one of the ones that's often noticeable in food crops is, is poor flavors, of the greens that are hot and spicy and bitter, uh, tomatoes that don't have any flavor, uh, carrots without much flavor. This is, a, this is another effect. So when we're gardening or, or growing, we need to remember that the more hot days they are, there are, the longer it can take some crops to mature because the hot days are also not growing days. So plants can adapt gradually to high or low temperatures, you know, but the things that wouldn't bother a, a garden plant in July would be damaging in May. Uh, but things that wouldn't uh, harm a, a hardened off fruit tree in January could damage it if it happened in October. So it's the extremes and out of season, the rapid changes between uh, uh, weather extremes that are, are the real problem for plants. So heat waves can ruin pollen. It's getting to the point now that um, a lot of home hobby greenhouses and even plastic tunnels just spend too much of the summer too hot to grow tomatoes and peppers. So I'm in a coastal region and that was a standby 30 years ago. Everybody had greenhouses because trying to get tomatoes ripe on the coast, especially on the outer coast when you get into the foggy areas. And even in those areas now, tomatoes are getting too, or sorry, greenhouses are getting too hot for things that flower like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers. And um, you start growing them outdoors and you realize how much better they're doing outdoors now than they are in greenhouses. And it's because of the heat. The pollen is sterilized at high temperatures. And if you have the little flowers are falling off, you usually don't really notice this happening. You notice injury when it's partially sterilized and you get weird tomatoes, yes, you can, you can notice that. But when you just lose the crop, you don't, you don't really see that happening. And then outdoors, we're seeing sun scald injury on you know, more and more plants more frequently. This is on uh, tomatoes and, and uh, even an apple turned up towards the sun. Very common on raspberries to see the, the droplets turning gray or brown or really beige colored, I guess. And that's just straight heat injury. That's not a disease. Typical heat injury on leaves is... Uh, it, uh, um, shown by the tissue that is farthest away from where the water is in the plant, where the sap is flowing in the veins. So outer edges, farther edges between the veins, you'll see this kind of injury. And uh, you, this is a rhododendron. This is a raspberry. This was in a heat wave the first week of May. And um, this raspberry plant, the tissue was just too soft and young and, and was injured. But we're also seeing um, growth abnormalities that are really strange. Um, premature flower formation and leafy greens. Now, I'm sure as gardeners, you've seen that when things have, have, have um, shot up to seed very quickly, like lettuce suddenly is very quickly goes to seed. But there's a lot of ways that uh, heat can disrupt flower development. Uh, to me, uh, sorry, um, cauliflower heads that are very almost overnight come apart completely and turn what's called ricey or premature. Maybe the head is really very small, but it still comes apart and does this. It's done growing. Green shoulders on tomatoes. If you've seen this, this is heat. Too much bright, bright light from uh, high temperatures directly on the shoulders of those fruit. In this case, allowing the tomato, keeping a lot more foliage on the tomato, not pruning the tomato plant as much would help because leaves would shade this and prevent this from happening. 
And this is a really strange thing. This happened during the heat dome where squash flowers, which should be uh, either male flowers or female flowers, some produce basically a combined sort of male-female um, partially developed. Here's a male part here, but this is obviously an ovary. These, these plants or these flowers never produce fruit. There are some pests in the region that have multiple generations, and the warmer the, the summer is, the, the more they can squeeze in an extra generation, and that can make a huge difference in pest damage from things like codling moth, uh, carrot rust fly, cabbage root maggot, and then of course fruit flies, which can breed within a week uh, um, in really high temperatures and beet leaf miner. These are all insects that as far north as I live, you can expect two generations a year with a partial third. But in these recent years, we've been definitely having at least three generations. And that last, the numbers in that later generation can be extremely high in the fall. I thought I'd just go back and throw this basic little infographic slide on here, uh, just to get us all on the same page with how plants work how high, temp uh, high temperatures stop the transpiration process. When plants transpire, water evaporating from the pores in the leaves here um, enables the water to be pulled up from the roots. So there's no little pumps in plants. They can't get anything out of the soil or from the roots if they're not having this evaporative process going on as moisture leaves the pores in the leaves. I mean, plants themselves are kind of like a pump. They're pulling uh, soil moisture up. And in the process, the um, elements, the nutrients in the soil get to the plant, but also the things that the plants make internally, sugars and starch and protein and oil and their own plant hormones, they also need that uh, transpiration to happen to be able to move this around to the buds and the fruit and the flowers where it, where it needs to be. But it also cools the leaves. This is an air conditioning system. Now, when plants are stressed and it's too high, and especially if it's combined with dry conditions, then the leaves have to close up those little pores that are called stomata. So at um, as soon as that happens, the leaves can't be cooled by evaporation and leaf temperatures immediately jump up. They can jump up five to 10 degrees higher. Um, and then you see leaf damage. This is a fig tree. You would think fig trees are very hardy to, or sorry, very uh, used to heat. This is a fig tree that's been damaged. Um, but they can't photosynthesize when those stomata are closed because those are the pores that they need to take in carbon dioxide and let out oxygen. And that means they can't produce food. But they also not getting any water from the roots. So none of the soil nutrients are carried up from the soil. So it's um, this happens if it's hot enough and it'll happen at lower temperatures if the soil is also dry and it is hot enough. So even though you irrigate um, a lot, there is a point at which this will happen anyway because of high temperatures. It's a survival mechanism for the plants. But it leads to some really strange metabolic disorders in crop plants, for example. And you know these things happen. They're an interaction between the way the plant's metabolism works and the weather and how you take care of that plant, whether you're irrigating and whether there's nutrients available, cultural methods. They, that influences the nutrient levels. Um, and calcium disorders, meaning ones in which calcium is deficient in the, in the cells, are the most common, and that is really directly related to heat or drought stressed plants. Because as soon as they close up the stomata, where's the calcium? The calcium is in the soil and they can't take it up. And then you have blossom end rot in tomatoes and peppers. This is a ferociously bad case of it. This is a greenhouse grower that lost $3,000 worth of crops in, uh, in a hot week. Um, this is the same kind of disorder, only it's in apples. And this is called bitter pit. It, these, these cells have died of calcium deficiency because uh, the apple tree was unable to get the calcium to the apple cells um, when it needed to. Now, that's just a few examples. Um, now, when we come to precipitation extremes, both drought and waterlogging 
injure and kill roots. In fact, they can happen waterlogging in the winter and the drought damage, heat and drought damage in the summer can set up a cycle where you're basically root pruning a tree or a shrub more and more every season. Um, and of course, then they can't take up nutrients and they can't take up water. And they're even more vulnerable to drought the next season because their roots have been pruned. They're more vulnerable to root diseases. And I, I heard an arborist the other day calling some of these zombie trees because they're actually dying. They they look like they're alive, they're still vertical, but you begin to see the needles changing color. And as soon as that happens, you know you're looking at actually a, a, a dead tree standing. Um, and they're certainly more likely to blow down because they've, the roots have been uh, basically pruned. And um, especially if it's something like a fruit tree or people uh, have allowed climbing plants to go up trees um, that's kind of a, a thing you see in landscape sometimes that just makes it more likely that those trees will blow down. And, and you just, you know, you can look anywhere and see this tree stress from the drier, warmer coastal summers. It's now widespread. Here's a hemlock that's died. But the main thing that we see is, is Western cedar, uh, Western red cedar in this region is dying out very rapidly, actually. Um, you know, traveling around the Olympic Peninsula, I mean, I think 15 years ago, we started to see cedar really starting to recede. And up Vancouver Island, which was really cedar cedar world, uh, they're dying very rapidly. And, and big blocks of cedar are, are dying now. It's probably the most well-known case of, of, of trees that are suffering. But our maple trees are suffering. And um, there's a, been a dieback disease in coastal Salal, and uh, they've now think that after quite a bit of research on this, that it's due to climate stress. So when, when plants are stressed, um, thinking of trees here, they're more open to attack from insects and pathogens because the trees don't have their normal um, ability to uh, um, fight back, as it were. I mean, a, a tree can actually pitch out a boring insect. Um, the, the pressure of the sap can actually knock the, the pest right out of the hole. So a weakened tree can't do that. And if the tree is weakened by poor growing conditions and then the borers arrive, people often think the borers cause the problem. The borers could only get in there because there already was a problem. And drought stress trees in, in uh, cities and towns and cities, on, especially on boulevards around your sidewalks, that's the aphids love those trees. Drought stressed plant material is really easy, easier for aphids to suck sap from. And it's, it's definitely a marker of, a, of drought stress in, in plants. And of course, if the immune defense that plants do have is weakened um, under such conditions, and then that means the pathogens can get in. So how can we make our food gardens and, and also landscapes more resilient? to this extremes in our weather. Well, the one, the first thing is, I know there'll be some master gardeners watching and, and people are gonna be asking you for advice on what to plant. And gardeners all do this. We all push the plant hardiness zones. We all, we think we're in zone, you know, we'll just try and get one a little bit zone. Wonder if we could get this to survive in our zone. Don't push the hardiness zones. The, 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 the zone maps that are published, they are updated periodically. I have seen the USDA maps changed over, you know, over the last 40 years, I've seen seen them changing, um, but they reflect sort of 30 year averages. And it's kind of a complicated formula with temperatures and frost free dates and wind patterns and all sorts of things go into it. But the more you, you know, especially along the coastal regions here, you know that people that live here know how complicated our geography is. You can have really very different zones um, in, a, in a small area, just because we have mountains and fjords and seashores and uh, the closer you get up to the, the Cascades. So complicated ge geography has made it, always made it difficult to apply zones. Um, but the variable weather now is making that even harder. So for coastal regions, this is Vancouver Island here, the, the finding that our winter minimums are getting lower is just further complicating things. And it may be the most important limit in terms of what we grow or what we decide to plant in our landscapes. So choosing resilient landscape plants, plants that are likely to survive unusual winter cold and summer heat. So that means growing plants that are 
you know, probably better in other, other climate zones than ours originally. Finding perennials. Once perennials are established, they're usually less vulnerable to bad weather or variable weather. Um, they usually need less water than annuals. And also, um, if they're killed back to the ground by cold, a lot of them do come back from the roots. So going into perennials rather than annuals and in the coastal regions here, and probably for most areas, looking at species, especially for long-term planting, species that have low summer water requirements. Now, these are some examples of native plants in the coastal Washington and British Columbia areas that are quite resilient. Many of, many of our native plants are pretty trouble-free and they're easy to grow. Um, and they need little or no irrigation. And the, the, uh, there's another important role that they have, which is to restore, restore native vegetation, which is absolutely essential for native insects. And native insects are absolutely essential for feeding birds and for pollinating. So there's, I won't, you know, that's sort of a whole other area to go into, but things like ocean spray and salmonberry and red flower and currant goldenrods are fantastic and Douglas Aster. Then the stone crops, these can make an enormously um, important contribution to um, native, making a patch of native vegetation for insects, but they're also lovely landscaping plants. In thinking about what trees to plant, the trees that will have a future in the landscape, it's, it's, it's been a hard nut to crack. And there's a number of theories, some people are trying to plant trees from drier and um, warmer zones. Other people are trying are saying that there's enough genetic diversity within the native species that we have here to just sort of plant them all and let them let nature take its course because the ones that are better adapted will survive. So it's it's hard to know. There are regional tree lists that are being published. For example, the Nature Conservancy in Washington, the City of Seattle, the City of Vancouver both have tree lists that are attempting to see what would uh, plan for what would grow better in the future. And when you have a, a plant that can live 100 years and the climate's changing this fast, it's very hard to know exactly what to plant. But you're always um, better off choosing species that are really well adapted to the soil and the site. And drainage is going to be an issue. Um, the heavy water logging events in the winter you may need to improve the drainage so that um, the roots don't sit in um, water for that per any period of time. Um, in our, particularly where I am, cedars and maples and birch and hemlock are probably suffering the most. Um, some of some trees suffering less so far are the spruce and junipers, pine, the Gary Oak or the Oregon Oak, and uh, what we call our butus up here and you call madrone seems less affected. Um, of course, things that break easily, willow and poplar and silver maple, maple make no sense in an urban landscape because of, of wind. And again, thinking of native species, they're especially valuable ecologically. For what to plant in our fruit orchards, there are cultivars and varieties of various tree fruits that flower later than others. And the later your variety fruits, or sorry, flowers, the less likely it is to lose flowers to late frosts. So it's gonna always be a problem with peaches and cherries, but there are apples that bloom considerably later than other apples, and they would be less prone to being lost. Self-fertile varieties of fruit trees and berries have a better chance of being pollinated. Bad weather during pollination periods really interferes with um, tree fruit that has to have insect pollination and bad weather can happen and that's the end of your crop. There are some fruits that don't require insect pollination, grapes and fig trees, for example, and these do really quite well here um, uh, in you know, where we live. It, well, at least in the coast, you can grow figs. Grapes, grapes are, a little, are hard, considerably hardier. There are some apple varieties that are really prone to these um, disorders from stress, heat and drought stress. For example, this uh, bitter pit that I showed you earlier, um, there are a few trees that are really notably poor uh, that are quite prone to this. But there's another um, disorder called water core, which is this. It looks, it's actually a strange distribution of sugars within the fruit, but it's virtually the same cause. Um, 
trees like king and fuji, fuji and transparents um, are quite prone to this as well. So if you're planting a new orchard, steering away from fruit that's particularly prone to some of these uh, weather-related disorders. Diseases are pathogen, pathogens that cause plant disease um, thrive, most of them thrive in wet weather or damp weather, or prolonged damp weather. Some thrive in dry weather. It's always wise to look for varieties or cultivars that are resistant to disease because you don't know whether it's going to be a wet year, for example, uh, in 2022, it was so wet that people where I live had hardly any apple tree apples on their trees because of scab. And yet this year, of course, we had gorgeous sunny weather. It was hot and dry and every apple tree had a huge crop. But to avoid the, um, the fruit losses last year, we simply had to have grown uh, scab resistant apples. There are scab resistant pears. There are downy mildew resistant vegetables. Uh, botrytis is a uh, tulip fire. These are tulips that are not affected by botrytis tulipi, and this is these were absolutely wiped out, the ones right beside it. So in dry weather diseases or pathogens are the powdery mildews, and there's a lot of different powdery mildews, but grapes and peas and squash and cucumbers and roses are all available that are resistant to powdery mildew. This is a zucchini leaf, a, a resistant zucchini, in a patch of squash that is obviously got powdery mildew. And it, it makes an enormous difference. This, this last year with this horrible uh, wet, long wet spring that we had in 2022, Gala or Royal Gala is extremely susceptible. This, it was so bad that the susceptible trees lost even their blossoms and their leaves. And 20 feet away, here's a honey crisp, which is resistant without a speck on it. So without even spraying or doing any other management, this is the difference between a resistant and a susceptible variety. And it's necessary, I think, to hedge our bets because we now don't know what the weather is going to be like, how extreme it will be at what time of year. So when we're trying to plant our vegetables, for example, and plan what we're going to grow, I think it's wise to always uh, grow a number of different varieties. Don't just have one kind of cabbage. Grow three kinds of cabbage. Even if you're just growing a few cabbages, grow three kinds of cabbages. Because there are really big differences between cultivars in how they tolerate whatever's going on, whether it's heat or drought or frost or variable weather. Here's cabbage. Here's a whole patch of cabbage that was all heading up beautifully, except for this one. And there's a row of these. and They've all um, have what's called blind head. There's no um, head going to develop in this because a late frost um, killed the um, developing, the apical meristem cells right in here that would become the cabbage. And yet all these other cabbages were fine. Had this person just grown this variety of cabbage, they probably may never figured out what happened, but certainly they would have thought that they couldn't grow cabbage again. So Especially sensitive um, crops are the big tomatoes, quite large tomatoes, um, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, sweet corn. These are typical crops that are most, um, I, say, I guess, least likely to tolerate extreme conditions. That said, though, a friend of mine was growing a cauliflower that she got from Johnny's Seeds this year, and it grew beautifully all summer, and everybody up here was completely floored because we had a summer that was so hot that there was just it was impossible to grow cauliflower and yet she had gorgeous purple moon cauliflowers and winter survival of chard or, or any plants is variable too this is you know five kinds of chard two of them um survived fine and three of them died and they're all in the same bed and they were all handled the same way. So this is a, a winter that got particularly cold. Usually I can have chard survive uh, most winters, but th so this just shows you that the differences between varieties or cultivars is can be quite large. So and unless you're growing a number of different varieties at once, you may, you know, you may in fact not, not realize that a particular plant you're growing is, is, um, not going to survive. Another thing we can do is, now this is the for coastal growers, and this is all the way down 
into Oregon, you can maximize growing things year round. Um, overwintering vegetables that, that were started the summer before, they have deep roots and they grow really fast in the spring. And even if it's been so cold that the tops are killed, they come back from the roots. So they are much more resilient to the bad weather end of the spectrum of weather um, and to pests than spring sown seedlings. This is the same patch of chard. It's all, you know, it's practically killed to the ground here. This is chard. There is the broccoli in the background all coming up. So it's the same garden just a month later. There's no way seedlings put in at that time could have produced this kind of crop. So going to the year round harvesting cycle that allows you to have plants with really deep, big root systems gives them a lot of resilience for, for spring weather. And uh, it's very popular um, to gr grow plants in raised beds. And I think that needs to be reconsidered because although if you're in a wet spot or a low spot or a cold spot, raised beds do have the advantage of better drainage and the soil warms up earlier in the spring but they need more water in the summer and the soil gets hotter in a heat wave than it does than soil that is, uh, that is not raised up. Permanent beds are always a really great way to garden because you're never walking. You're always walking in the pathway here. So you're never walking on the growing bed. You're never compacting it and you invest all of your resources at whatever you're putting in, in terms of fertility and compost into that growing bed and um, not wasting it. Uh, on the uh, pathways, all good, but beds don't have to be raised. And I think a lot less, a lot fewer beds should be raised now than, um, than are. A lot of people think that that's the only way to garden is you have to start with a raised bed. We're also going to have to be just very flexible. We have to, you know, basically roll, our, roll with the punches. And whatever's going on with current weather, be ready to just pull out the plants you've got if they can't take it and replant them. If it's just a hot summer, really hot, it just keeps cycling in heat waves, then peas and cauliflower, maybe not. No, it, but we can have summers that are too cool for melons or eggplants. In either case, you can replant with um, vegetable varieties that are really have a quite short period of days to harvest. Um, 40 to 60 days to harvest. Um, you can get zucchini and bush beans and uh, a lot of root crops, carrots, think of carrots, beets, and turnips. They can all be eaten when they're quite small as baby, baby uh, roots. Uh, leafy greens, you can eat them at any size. They're quite tolerant, actually, of heat. Kale and Swiss chard uh, really are, they do, do perfectly well in, in hot weather. If it's a cool summer, there are some really early cabbages and lettuces and leafy greens and root crops that you can also grow. So I think the take home message here is one that it's, it's hard to do it, but you just need to change um, what you're growing pretty quickly and just take out what isn't doing well and immediately reseed with something that has a better chance of making it. And then whatever's going on with the current weather at the seeding time is how you manage that seeding. If it's cool weather or if it, usually it's spring, but it's not always. Spring can, can sometimes be very hot. Um, this, this soil needs to be 60 degrees Fahrenheit to sow seeds. So wait until it's that warm or lay clear plastic down or put a cold frame over it so it warms the soil up. In summer or in warm or hot weather or a heat wave, which again, uh, we've seen some pretty severe heat waves where I live now on the coast here. The first week of May, we've had extreme heat. And if you were trying to grow things, if your head was sort of thinking about spring seeding and the soil is cool and it's, you know, it's wet and, you know, you're just not thinking that it's too hot and too dry, you can be very disappointed in germination because lettuce and carrots and parsnips and other there are corn salad, there are other plants that will not germinate when it's that warm, even though the soil is, is, has been um, watered, it's kept wet. So if it's warm, when you're trying to sow things, sow a little bit deeper and then water the beds and then shade them. Just, you know, standard practice, have some materials to shade the beds. It could be white plastic, it could be newspapers, um, you know, turning compost bags inside and out, burlap, old beach towels. These are all things that can shade a bed until till the uh, plants germinate. 
And then we do have to be ready for heat waves anytime. As I said, we've had heat waves here the first week of May, which was a real shock. Um, and so the priorities for shading are anything that's very small, any kind of seeds or seedlings, and the cool weather crops like the cabbage family and the lettuce and, and uh, leafy greens, peas, cauliflower. Um, try and get some fine mulch in between the plants and get some kind of shading on those seedlings. People say, well, they can't grow under the shade. Well, they actually can. If you use something like 50% shading factor, which means it's roughly cutting out about half the light. That's what the shade cloth is doing. It Plants can grow. They can get enough light to do well. Uh, if you don't um, shade them, they can just be simply killed because their little roots are so close to the surface here that they, uh, they, they literally fry. I mean, if you put your hand on wet soil in bright sun, you could see uh, feel how hot that soil is. So it's, um, they just absolutely have to be shaded. So invest in some kind of shading materials. You know, the thrift shops are a great place to get lace curtain materials for very cheap. Um, but of course you can buy shade cloth as well. You don't want extreme shading. You do need that light to get through. So 30 to 50% shading is, uh, is ideal. But you know, the lace tablecloths work well too. In this case, not much light is going to get through this. And so the best way to deploy these kinds of materials is to sort of put them on around 10 o'clock in the morning and take them off around four in the afternoon so that the morning sun and the afternoon sun and some reflected daytime sun can get in there enough for seedlings. Or build lattice work. Um, you know, the British gardeners had, uh, used to have all kinds of lattice work uh, constructions for their lettuce beds and things like that. And we can go back to that rather than buying these plastic shade cloths. There are, um, there's really no end to the ingenuity that we could apply to making uh, shade covers. This is a little one that folds here and hinges. Um, you know, people that do basketry could make woven panels. Uh, anything, anything can work to shade. And greenhouses and tunnels, as I said earlier, are getting too hot. So shading them is, is actually starting to be a very necessary practice most, year, most years. Not just opening the doors and vents, but you do need to do that. You may need to install more ventilation and you may need to add fans if you don't have fans, that high-speed fans to move that air. And you quite likely need to use some kind of shading in heat waves. The, I, I was looking at a, a, a beautiful new Halls greenhouse the other day that someone that I know just bought. And you know, that's the standard greenhouse design. It's been the same forever. <laughs> and there was no way there were enough vents in that greenhouse uh, for the heat that we're getting now. So it's going to absolutely have to be shaded. And something that I just tried this summer, it actually worked really well. I was putting spring peas down the sides of beds and trellising them up. And the peas were providing some shade, but of course the peas are only, the really early peas are done in July, but I left them there for the rest of the summer, just as a living, well, no, I guess in this case, dying, a dead, it was like a screen. They just stayed on the trellises um, and just left them in place. You could do the same thing with uh, pole beans as well, and they would be alive all summer and plants on either side that are on the, the shady side or the side away from the hottest afternoon sun would um, be shaded, be cooled. We're going to have to think up a lot more um, tips and tips and techniques like this. And we still aren't going to be um, free of the late, the risk of a late spring frost. So keeping materials on hand, whether it's old milk jugs or um, floating row cover or tarps or whatever, keeping uh, things available for frost protection in the spring, it's still going to happen. And winter temperatures now uh, in this region where I am, we tend to get an Arctic outbreak or two in the winter and they used to be two or three days long, but they're a lot longer now. In fact, in just a, a couple of years ago, we had one that went on for three weeks did a tremendous amount of damage in February. So covering things is, you know, starting to be more important. 
and um, some vegetables that I used to leave out and never cover. Now I am I am having to cover them. Now just temporary covers is fine. Throw a tarp over it, and then when the weather warms up, you fold the tarp up and put it back in the garage. You can uh, put some kind of support under it. This is a this is stucco wire. You can kind of see it here curving up over the bed just to act as something to hold up the snow and uh, things actually stayed pretty well into that but you can actually go into much better designed covers than my very temporary covers that I just showed you but whatever you do they need to be low profile for wind and they need to be very sturdy and very well secured so if it's heavy wet snow or high winds those are all wintertime risks and these, you know, this is a, a set of cold frames that was built before World War I in England. Still worked great. Anybody that wants to invest in some really capacious, uh, you know, cold frames, great way to get things through the winter here. When we're having an Arctic outbreak or extremely cold weather, it would still be a good idea to put some insulating material over that glazing. These, these would be shut and you could throw tarps or put straw over the glazing. So we need to mulch year round. It keeps the soil cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter. Um, it reduces evaporation in the summer. It protects the soil from erosion from um, in the winter time, um, from heavy rainfall and from nutrient loss. And of course, there's all the other good things that happen that build, building soil organic matter and in you know increasing soil fertility, but it also controls weeds year round. So be ready for heavier rainfalls. Um, the making sure the soil drain, just check that soil drainage. I mean, places that were really good 20 years ago were doing fine for the winter may now not be as well drained as you might have thought of it for extremely heavy rainfall. So especially for trees and, and perennials that are having to live through the winter, the um, water logging is, a, is very problematical. So you may need raised beds for some of the winter vegetables or for strawberries even though you may not be using raised beds elsewhere. And just keep the soil surface covered. Planning for even drier summers than we have now, um, water conserving irrigation systems. Municipalities have been beating the drum on that for many years. In a lot of places we've had water restrictions and incentives to put in ir drip irrigation systems for many years. A lot of household water can be easily collected and used. Um, and then another tip is that planting trees and shrubs in the fall means that they have a chance to get their roots established. And again, this is something for coastal gardeners. They have a chance to get their roots well established over the winter, and then they will need less water next summer in their first year. If you can collect rainwater in dry regions, that is, um, it's, it's surprising how much you can collect. There's 2000 gallons there of tanks and it just coming off of half of the roof of a one, one car garage. So there's just a lot of rain that comes down and gets lost. And so some municipalities and some counties, some areas have had rebate programs for water collection. So look into that. There's usually no shortage of water if you look at it from an annual basis. It's just that it comes in the winter and we don't have it in the summer in a lot of areas. High winds can happen anytime. Plants loaded with fruit in our gardens are really heavy. And, and things that are on tall trellises like pole beans also really catch the wind. So supporting anything that's top heavy, like tomato plants or peppers, um, cabbage uh, family plants, or they're very heavy big tops and quite a narrow stem going into the ground. Strong trellises for all this uh, plant material are really required. And the heavy wet snow in areas where the snow is, um, it's close to freezing uh, temperatures, the snow can get very heavy and actually do as much damage as wind. So staking up plants. I, I take the tomato cages off every year and put them on the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts for the winter. I've taken to storm proofing in the fall, woody plants. Didn't used to ever do this, but I go around and prune trellised roses and uh, climbing vines and you know kiwi and grapes and things. I take off sort of two thirds of the wood that I know that I would remove in the normal pruning period, but I do it right now 
before the big storms hit and before the heavy snow because or ice storms or whatever because um, the weight of the full um, vegetation if we have an ice storm um, or heavy wet snow can easily bring down a fence or a trellis and I keep in permanent staking into the shrubs that are forming a hedge that are outdoor out for example um, in the landscape prevent them from being tipped or blown over or weighed down by heavy snow. Now gardeners can also contribute um, to the effort to mitigate the climate change and basically that's by sequestering carbon. So increasing the carbon held in the soil removes it from the atmosphere. Plants are carbon. That's what that's where they're just built out of carbon basically with a little bit of other materials in there, uh, other uh, elements in there. And so plants hold carbon in the their plant tissue, but in their roots, also in the um, carbon is held in the humus and the soil and the soil microbes and very deep in the soil profile now we know that um, organic carbon is also um, held. So maximizing the amount of living roots throughout the soil year round is, is a way to maximize the amount of carbon held. So to a gardener, what that means is add more plants. Everybody loves to be told that more plants in greater variety to your yard and garden, increase the density of plantings, put vines and climbers on fences. Um, it's, 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 quite a, it's quite amazing how many little blank spots for ground covers and places under trees and shrubs and in rock walls where more and more plants can be added. Oops, sorry. My, my screen is doing something very fun. Um, so deep carbon, now this is the carbon that is held by plant roots for a very long time. This is, um, especially trees, hold carbon in their roots. And it's been found now that they actually, the roots are also creating channels and this dissolved organic carbon goes many yards deep in the soil. And it bonds with mineral particles there. So it isn't just held in the living fraction. It's now become part of, of the mineral fraction in your, your soil. And that can be there for a thousand years. And you know, you could fit a lot in a pretty small space. And when you think about garden designing a, a food garden, um, you know, some designs pr produce more food per square yard. Uh, this person, you can't even walk in the garden. Um, it's great. It's fantastic. It just plants and produ productivity everywhere. Um, this garden is using a lot of infrastructure and there's a lot of wasted space where things could be growing. So the way you design your garden can, can um, um, affect how well you help hold carbon in the soil. Building soil organic matter, um, carbon is held in the humus, which is the completely decomposed fraction of organic matter. Once, when it's been really decomposed, it's basically black sticky stuff. It doesn't look like uh, compost at all. And that is, it's debatable. I mean, people thought it was held longer than it is, but it cycles in a more rapid way than the carbon in the, the deeper carbon in the soil. But it is held there for a certain period of time. And it also improves soil structure and water holding capacity. Um, the interesting thing is that chop and drop, which is just leaving the organic matter on the surface of the soil, whether it's your crop residues or leaves or mulching materials, just leaving that on the soil surface actually increases soil organic matter faster than digging in composted material. So, you know, just that's the way nature does it. And it turns out to be a very effective way. Now, uh, this is an example here I showed you of, um, I'm showing you a corn roots here. Corn as a grass has massive amount of root material. If you cut your, at the time you harvest your corn, you simply cut the stalks off and leave all of the roots in the ground over the winter. This is what's left. So all of that amazing organic material is just remains right where it was and it is completely decomposed by spring. So using compost um, and building com uh, soil organic matter are also ways to hold carbon. Minimizing soil disturbance. 
cultivation speeds up the release of carbon from the soil and it disrupts the uh, soil microbes the well it's the whole community of soil organisms and microorganisms that live in the upper um, six or eight inches of soil so using no-till methods and or infrequent or very shallow cultivation it's impossible to not disturb the soil completely in a vegetable garden if you think about pulling out carrots of course you've disturbed the soil but you don't have to dig deeply and turn it over and that is the kind of cultivation that is really damaging that releases the carbon and dis disrupts the the microbial community wherever you can just plant one crop after another these are pea vines that have just been chopped down left on the ground to become mulch and a little hole dug right in there and put the cauliflower plant in so it, where you can do that uh, this is seeds for the winter greens have just been sown between corn stalk, uh, corn stubs of corn stalks. And composting with care. Um, co poorly made compost actually produces methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. If you're going to have soggy, poorly aerated compost, you would have been better off to spread that plant material around on the ground and let it decompose without trying to put it into a compost pile. So it loses nutrients, but it also contributes uh, a greenhouse gas. And some of uh, the garden myth I always mention here is that if you've got lime or you may have wood ashes from a fireplace or a barbecue, never put that in the compost pile. You might very well want to put it on the soil in the garden, but by putting it in the compost pile, you make a, a layer of alkaline conditions and the creatures that grow in those kinds of conditions release nitrogen to the air. To the atmosphere which is another greenhouse gas so and it loses nutrients so you don't need to do that there's no need to make um, uh, lime or calcium more available or wood ashes by composting at first and i just have a last couple point a few points here think about reducing the area of any kind of cultivated garden and lawns actually lawns are the very worst kinds of plants for uh, holding carbon. They probably hold the least carbon of all the other things that we might want to grow in our yards and our landscapes. So if you can grow more food in a smaller area, you can use the extra space and you could plant more trees or restore native vegetation. Um, you could add flowers for insect forage. So maximizing the harvest from a smaller food garden, this is one of my, this is last summer, I think, um, you know, this is my slide called Who Needs Pathways Anyway? If you grow intensively and interplant and make the most of succession planting and in the climates where you can grow all year round, do that, then you don't really need a very big garden. And that will allow you space to plant some other things. And permanent perennial plantings are going to hold more carbon than our annual food garden does. Some other things gardeners can do, think about replacing any use of peat moss. Instead, use compost or wood fiber, core, which is coconut fiber. Peat bogs hold more carbon globally than all of the standing forests on the planet. Um, try and reduce the use of plastic. Uh, you know, if you've got plastic items, don't get rid of them. Make them last as long as possible. Carefully take care of them. Keep them clean. Keep them, you know, out of the heat. Um, recycle things. Just don't buy new products. Use compost instead of artificial nitrogen fertilizers. Those fertilizers take a lot of energy to make. And in the process, they also, in the, you know, in the industrial process, they also release nitrous oxide, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. Learn to save your own seeds. Select plants for adaptation to variable weather. Um, it enhances our local seed and food security. And that's a whole nother topic. But even at a garden scale, after a few years, if you're saving seeds from things that are doing very well in your garden, you're probably saving seeds for plants that are more resilient. And moving, you know, moving away from gas powered tools and when things need to be replaced uh, using electric or manual tools. But here's, here's my, you know, sort of my final slide here. Resilient gardeners and resilient gardens. To have a resilient garden, you have to have a resilient gardener and vice versa. So the first thing I think 
uh, out of the of this whole message is to be flexible. I think we need to be ready to rethink and adapt every aspect of our plant culture. Um, design and manage gardens to protect plants from extreme heat and cold and drought and high winds, prevent water logging. That means being right on top of weather forecasts and know what you're going to do. If it's hot, know where your shade cloth is. If it's cold, know where that tarp is. Um, and then choosing species and cultivars that tolerate the variable weather. And that's going to be a work in progress. Talking to other gardeners, trying lots of things yourself, and keeping records. And then just be on top of you know, crop schedules. Um, adapt to what's going on at the time. Be prepared to replant. It's no good saying we didn't used to have to grow this way. It, things have changed. Um, and then do what you can to increase the amount of carbon that is being sequestered in the soil between mulching and year-round planting and growing more deep-rooted perennial trees and shrubs. And then as, you know, as budgets permit, you know, making longer-term plans to enhance your plantings, uh, you may be able to install some rainwater storage, you may be able to put in micro-irrigation and restore native plant habitat. So it's, it's really, uh, I guess my bottom line here is be prepared for extreme weather all year round and use your garden and your landscape to capture carbon.